we need a jarring wake-up call because if we would actually pay attention, there are so many precious saints who are jettisoning orthodoxy, jettisoning biblical fidelity because we have fallen asleep at the wheel. I mooned my neighbor last week and it was an accidental eclipse. I didn't really mean to moon my neighbor, um, but we live out in the boonies. And so his son, Luca, who's a little boy, comes over when we're on the road at Propel and other events, he comes over to let my dog out and make sure everything's copacetic. We live in a little farm at about 30 miles south of Nashville, Tennessee. Well, last week I forgot to tell Luca that we actually got on a late flight. And so we were gonna be home on Saturday night instead of Sunday morning. And I realized my error in miscommunication the following morning, I mean that that evening, because when I got home, I wanted pajamas and my pajamas in my suitcase were dirty. And I thought, I think there's some pajamas in the dryer. After 50, your memory gets kind of like your, the things that Spanx hold in, just a little, little, little jiggly. And I thought, I'm pretty sure there's put some pajamas in the dryer. Well, we live out in the boonies. I'm on five acres. Unless you fly a drone over our home, you can't see us. And so I'm in the habit of occasional nudity. And so I thought, I'll just, just walk right through the kitchen. It's, you know, 10 o'clock at night and I'll go to the dryer and see if there's some pajamas in the dryer. And so right about the time I'm waltzing through the kitchen and my kitchen butts up against my front porch and there's huge windows from the kitchen overlooking the front porch. Right about the time I'm cruising to the dryer, I hear Luca, not just Luca's footsteps, but his daddy, Jeff, because it's late at night and they're coming to make sure my dog gets out one last time because I forgot to tell him we were actually gonna be home and Luca has his own key. And I realized in that moment, I can't tell them not to come in because if I yell, they're gonna see me in all of my glory. And Luca's gonna be permanently scarred and Jeff is gonna have a heart attack on my front porch. And then there's huge glass panels on either side of our front door. So I had just a moment to make a decision and I thought really my only choice is to dive behind the kitchen island and crab crawl as fast as I can to the dryer and pray that there's something besides hand towels in the dryer. And so that's what I did. I literally dove to the floor and naked crab crawled as fast as I could into where the dryer is and I opened the dryer door at the exact moment that Luca was opening my front door. And you have never seen somebody shimmy into yoga pants and a ratty t-shirt faster than I did. And I came out right as they were coming in and he saw just a little bit of moon. It was like a quarter moon. (laughs) It it was close because they were a little tight from the dryer. Um, But... (laughs) I thought after they left that night, a little shell-shocked, I thought, oh honey, you have no idea. It could have been so much worse than just a quarter moon. I thought, you know what? That is the most jarring kind of wake-up call because I was almost in that sleepwalking oblivion before I saw them on my front porch. I thought that's the most jarring wake-up call I've had in a long time. And I kept thinking about it. And I found myself by the next day thinking, that's exactly what the church needs. That's exactly what the church in post-modernity needs. We need a jarring wake-up call because if we would actually pay attention, there are so many precious saints who are jettisoning orthodoxy, jettisoning biblical fidelity because we have fallen asleep at the wheel. If you brought your Bibles, would you turn to Genesis? Genesis chapter one. Genesis chapter one, actually I told you a tale, Genesis chapter three. Genesis chapter three, verse 21. Actually back up, we'll start at verse one. I wanna give you the full Monty, biblically speaking. Now the serpent was more crafty than the other beasts of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say? You shall not eat of any tree in the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. 
For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. I feel like I hear the same theme on Twitter every single day. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took its fruit and ate and she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day and the man and his wife hid from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to man and said to him, where are you? Interesting that God is completely omniscient. He knows exactly where they are. But part of his mercy is helping us to be cognizant of how we've drifted. So this is a merciful question. It's not a diagnostic question. Where are you? In other words, where have you drifted? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. God said, who? Who told you you were naked? Chris often preaches, since when did somebody else's voice elevate above God's and ours or our cultures as being absolutely authoritative? He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. I wanted to go to Chipotle, but she just told me to eat here. (laughs) It's a tiny bit of liberty with the text right there. Just wanted to make that clear. (laughs) Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? Verse 21. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Then the Lord said, behold, The man has become like one of us in knowing what is good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man and at the east of the garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. This has been read over and over and over again in both evangelical culture and secular culture as a punitive passage. It's depicted God as kind of this unibrowed librarian who boots us out of his presence whenever we make a misstep. Y'all, we've been reading it wrong. If you read this passage in the context it was written, in the context it was given, you'll recognize that the word right there, drove out the man in verse 24, comes from the Hebrew word galrash, which is also used in a redemptive context in Exodus when it says God realized his people, and I'm paraphrasing here, were idiots, and so he herded them out of slavery into freedom. He herded them like a good shepherd away from what would kill them into greener pastures for their own good because they didn't even know how to leave slavery. When you stop and think of the context of the Garden of Eden, what would have happened had they eaten from the tree of life? What would have happened? Y'all can talk back. It's not Sunday morning. I'm not a pastor. What would have happened? They would have been forever frozen in the Garden of Eden, forever separated from the intimacy with God that he designed them for. And so when God recognizes, not only have these yahoos gone to the wrong menu, if I do not usher them out, they will never have a shot at having the intimacy with me I created them for redeemed. So he ushers them out of the garden only after he clothes them in leather, ushers them out. Yes, he ushers them out because of original sin, but y'all, he ushers them out because of miraculous mercy. This way I can begin the redemptive process. And then he establishes an angel, a cherubim, a chubby angel, an angel in Spanx, and a flaming sword as these divine bouncers, not because humans are bad, but because he wants to make sure Imago Day doesn't get back to that tree and be forever frozen, separated from him. It's actually incredibly redemptive if we read it right. Yes. 